Aloha and welcome to your Thursday afternoon with Justine and Matt and the Hawaii Food and Farmer series. Every other week, me and Matt are here and we bring on farmers, all kinds of food producers, different business owners and organizations that all contribute to the local food system that exists here in Honolulu and across the state of Hawaii. We get to hear their history and background and learn why they love what they do and kind of the role they see for themselves in local food and what they see coming up. We get all the inside scoop. All of it. All of it. So <laughs> who do we have on today, Matt? Thanks, Justine. So yeah, actually today we're even going outside of Hawaii. We're oh going my God. international. Um, so super exciting for that. Uh, so with us today we have Scott Allen and also Scott McCoy who are with Uncultivated Inc. Um, so thank you so much for being on the show with us today. Thank you very much. Thank Happy you. to and, be here. Uh, yeah, we've been going back and forth for a few weeks now trying to get you guys scheduled. So thank you for, uh, I'm glad it all worked out and we're mm -hmm. all here uh, together. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, before we kind of get into your own personal backgrounds, give us a little background on Uncultivated. What, what is that all about? Um, so Uncultivated, we founded it uh, late 2015 and we were hoping to be able to address um, food security issues, uh, help communities build uh, more, more resilient food systems. Nice. So uh, you guys are based here in Hawaii, um, so obviously working on projects here, but then uh, you guys are kind of all over the globe. Where else are you guys working? Yeah, so um, the initiatives that we're working on uh, are really meant to be able to uh, bring them to communities all over the world. Um, so currently uh, we're working with uh, a group or community in Haiti uh, to try to bring a few of our initiatives to there to help build um, more re uh, resilient local systems in Haiti. And so what exactly are those initiatives? You, you guys have your kind of main goal and then what are the, what do your specific projects look like? Yeah, so um, we've got two main initiatives that we're working on right now uh, to address uh, building resilient food systems. Um, the first is the Abundant Earth Initiative, uh, which taps into my background a little bit. Um, and that is a uh, program where we set up uh, agroforestry hubs in communities where community members can come learn about uh, agroforestry and regenerative agriculture and then take those seeds and cuttings and use them to grow food at home or start another seed bank somewhere else as well. Uh, and then we've got the mapping local food sheds initiative. Yeah, so <coughs> we're also trying to encourage communities to support local food sheds. Um, a food shed being uh, the geographic area between where uh, food is grown and where it's consumed and then ultimately where it goes as far as waste mm -hmm. um, and we're trying to involve communities get them to participate in discussions uh, get them to know you know where the different uh, players are within their food systems uh, so that they can better support them um, and also have a better idea of how resources flow through um, their community uh, so you know we have mapping initiatives um, that <clears throat> we actually launched earlier this year that was uh, global. We partnered with um, GIS Corps, uh, which is a volunteer-based organization that provides GIS services. And we uh, collaborated on this, and we had over 150 uh, communities worldwide participate in helping map um, uh, contributors to their local food shed. Okay. Yeah. So... Uh, to clarify, you have kind of a, a broad educational resource center um, kind of attribute to the organization, as well as kind of a hands-on workshop type of thing. Yeah, like both ends of yeah, that. yeah, exactly. We're trying to um, approach it from both angles. So uh, be able to educate and inform and give people uh, tools to become more in touch with their local food system, mm -hmm. and then also ways to um, build it. And, and actually use those tools uh, to produce their own food um, and get in touch with, with uh, that aspect of it, yeah. And the kind of local global approach, if you can, I guess, consider that, um, is important because you can get 
different communities approaching the same things mm -hmm. in different ways yeah. around the world. And when they're all kind of um, aiming for the same goals, then you can do cross comparisons and you can see, you know, yeah. like what's working here, what's yeah. not. You know, maybe if they were to approach it in the same way as this community, they would have better results. Mm -hmm. So it's really community building and what you guys are doing around using the different tools of agroforestry mm -hmm. as a way to do that. Um, so I definitely want to, it's interesting the, the, I guess the relationship you guys have where, Scott, you have more of the uh, GIS uh, computer background, and then Scott, uh, you have the permaculture, agroforestry, and also small business background. Um, mm -hmm. Let's hear a little bit about that. Can you talk about What's, what kind of business are you in, you're doing here in Hawaii? Yeah, so um, I've, I've been in Hawaii for almost five years now. Uh, and I went to school originally um, for environmental studies and in sustainability. I worked on a lot of organic farms throughout college uh, and after college. And it was actually kind of the last thing in the world that I ever wanted to get into. <laughs> uh, I had no interest, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, but because even in organic agriculture, uh, you can have a lot of destructive practices mm -hmm. along with it. Um, but then um, about three years ago, uh, I discovered permaculture and got my permaculture certificate. Um, and since then, um, it's become pretty much everything that I do. Uh, I started um, a business setting up uh, regenerative agroforestry systems in people's homes. Mm -hmm. uh, so I primarily do that now, and then we started the nonprofit mm -hmm. uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, and that's just another way to um, approach this problem, kind of taking both a for-profit angle and a nonprofit angle to help build uh, more resilient systems and get people growing food. So mm -hmm. Uncultivated offers the, these resources free to the community? <coughs> yes. Workshops are free to attend and the seeds yep. and things are giving out? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, totally. And then um, my for-profit business, uh, I offer uh, at-home design, consultation, installation, and maintenance uh, of their uh, own food forest at home. But uh, through the nonprofit, we also provide everything that you would ever need to replace my job essentially <laughs> but it's really just another way of you know trying to push uh, local food and growing food as much yeah. as possible could you explain what the difference or if there's a difference between setting up say like a permaculture garden in someone's backyard versus an agroforest yeah so um agroforestry uh would, it, you, would it, you even say that in agroforest is it like uh, that makes sense what Food forest works. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, permaculture largely works with uh, regenerative systems, kind of closing the loop. Um, and agroforestry, uh, in particular, is a way of cultivating food that uh, combines both trees, shrubs, herbs. Uh, and it's largely perennial crops. Uh, so it's something that you plant once, mm -hmm. and you're essentially just uh, pruning and harvesting. And agroforestry, yeah, super simple. Um, I love it. It's really what I advocate. Mm -hmm. um, it essentially mimics nature. It, it's taking what nature does to... Uh, create abundance, which is what it's been doing for millions and millions of years. Uh, you take those same principles uh, like no tilling, uh, using nitrogen fixing species to grow your own fertilizer, uh, creating habitats for beneficial insects so you reduce the need for any pesticides, and with the no till, you dramatically uh, reduce herbicides. So if you walk into a forest, you know, no one's watering it, no one's spraying it, no one's tilling it, no one's, tilling <laughs> it, no one's using herbicides, right? Yeah. Um, and we're taking those same principles to grow food. In general, it's uh, far more low maintenance 
than home gardening, the kind of stuff that you see on like a Home Depot commercial, with yeah, yeah, yeah. or based bed and Miracle Grow mm -hmm. and those all of that. Those gardens do look amazing on those commercials, they, though. They do look really good. <laughs> I have to admit, yeah. Um, but there's there's an appeal about agroforestry um, aesthetically uh, because it's three dimensional, mm -hmm. so it's not just this sort of flat. Uh, two-dimensional space like you see in monocropping yeah. uh, or even a lot of home like vegetable gardens um, but it's really applicable especially to the tropics it's uh, the way that the Hawaiians grew food for mm -hmm. really a long time mm -hmm. uh, their upland dry um, food production mm -hmm. uh, that wasn't the low E fields was mixed agriculture of breadfruit and um, bananas and dryland kalo, sweet potato, sugarcane, things like that, all sort of working together in, in the natural system. Oh. Mm -hmm. And so when you guys are, are doing these workshops, is, can this be applied commercially or the idea is that everyone's kind of setting up their own independent space or is there community space in terms of having this abundance of food that's growing locally or are you guys also consulting with farmers to apply this on a commercial scale? Yeah, so we provide um, all of the educational material and resources and we do workshops uh, for people. When it comes to like uh, specific consultations for residences and farms and things like that, uh, we, we shy away from um, simply because we're we're really interested in creating community centers mm -hmm. and community hubs. Okay. So if someone's interested in uh, holding workshops and something that has a sort of outreach approach, mm -hmm. uh, then you know we would love to work with them. But it has to be something that becomes really multifaceted in the community and their contribution to give back. So. Mm -hmm. um, before we have to get away to a break, uh, I want to hear a little bit from Scott. Uh, a little bit on your background, so you have more of like the GIS uh, part to Scott's uh, permaculture <laughs> background. Yeah, so I've been working in the GIS community for about seven years now, and most of that time I've been employed uh, in the private sector, but I've also, in my spare time, worked with other nonprofit organizations. Um, I've gotten to, you know, uh, do a lot of uh, community-based mapping projects, which is kind of uh, what you know influenced some of our own initiatives uh, getting out and showing communities how they can use something as simple as their cell phone uh, to collect data yeah. and that that data can be immediately available and help them kind of understand their community and the world around them better is definitely something that has been a draw um, as far as civil society goes um, <clears throat> truthfully I didn't really know too much about agriculture until I met this guy. Um, and that's part of what I really like about this. I'm always learning new things. Um, you know, I'm always out there trying to help him as much as I can when we're in the garden and just absorb as much of the information because, you know, I actually grew up on a tobacco farm. Oh, no uh, but, you know, that's monocropping, mm -hmm. right? And I understand how much work goes into it and it's every year you know you're just planting a large crop um, and you have to do it every year but then you know you take something like agroforestry and not only are you you know creating something that you don't have to redo every year but it's more space efficient too because you're stacking the layers vertically um, you know you can have food growing on food mm -hmm. you know a fruit tree with a food uh, uh, an edible vine growing up it yeah. and then right underneath it you know you have bush and you know it makes sense um, and just we've been kind of working from these different angles to find all the different ways that we can connect uh, these different pieces I suppose yeah nice. We are going to have to go to a break soon but not yet okay. um, can you talk about so the Talk about a project that's going on locally that you guys have going on in Waimanalo. Waimanalo? Um, well, we are uh, teaming up with I Love Nalo, the restaurant. Um, and, and, and they've been on the show before. I don't know if you knew that. Beautiful. Uh, yeah, Mike yeah. was on, yeah, right? Yeah, the yeah, show? Mike yeah was on the show. totally. He was like uh, guest, guest number, number two. two. Yeah. 
Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Wow, what a privilege. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, I, I, I actually am going to be working with I Love Nalo mm -hmm. and Mike to uh, help bring um, more recipes for local foods. There's a lot of local foods that are really underutilized mm. that people aren't, that, that aren't part of like the common palate here in Hawaii. I mean, uh, because also farmers aren't growing them? Uh, partially, but it it's also has to do a lot with how much food is imported uh, and then um, actually just shifting restaurants and people's palates over to more local foods. You know, if you walk into somewhere like Safeway or something, most of those fruits and vegetables you see don't really grow that well in Hawaii. They're more for northern climates. Um, you know, things like uh, lettuce and cucumbers mm -hmm. and things like that. Uh, but yeah, we're uh, working with the restaurant I Love Nalo to uh, provide free workshops in the garden that they have uh, out back. If you haven't been there, definitely go check it out. I did it, so it's super <laughs> rad. Yeah. <laughs> now that we have a little taste of what you're doing in Wamanalo, we're going to take a quick 60 second break and get back to it. Great. Thanks. Aloha. My name is John Waihe, and I used to be a part of all the things that you might be angry at. I served in government here and may have made decisions that affects you. So I want to invite you in. I want to invite you in to Talk Story with me and some very special guests every other Monday here at Talk Story with John Waihe. Come on in, join us, express your opinion, learn more about your state, and then do something about it. Aloha. Please do. Hi, and welcome back to Hawaii Food and Farmer Series. I'm your co-host, Justini Spiritu. This is my co-host, Matthew Johnson. Mm -hmm. Today we have Scott and Scott from Uncultivated talking about <laughs> the organization they started that is not only an educational, informative uh, resource, but also doing hands-on workshops to kind of spread the knowledge and practice of agroforestry in communities. And so we've heard that you've partnered with a restaurant, I Love Nalo, in Waimanalo. Mm -hmm. And I want to hear more about what's going on internationally. How did you connect with this group in Haiti, and what does that project look like specifically? Yeah, so I guess sometime middle of last year, we were put in touch with uh, an agronomist local to Haiti, um, specifically working out of the community of Basin. And uh, we started talking, and uh, we wanted to approach it where we weren't just um, telling them, here's what we want to do, but kind of get an idea of what the community wanted, what they needed, um, and see if there was room for us to kind of collaborate and kind of uh, co-create a project. Um, so we've been in the works for that, or with that, for about a year, and we're finally starting to gain some traction. We've been doing a lot of preliminary research about the community, trying to get to know them as people, um, you know, like even like what they do in their spare time, mm -hmm. what sorts of foods are already grown there. And uh, the aim is to uh, start an agroforestry hub within Haiti um, to provide solutions uh, to the deforestation uh, that they've, I'm not that they've done, but uh, Haiti is very heavily deforested, mm -hmm. um, and the agronomist, agronomist that we're working with is um, involved with a lot of projects uh, to reforest Haiti. So I'm gonna, sorry. Oh, sorry, we actually have a call-in question. Oh, so we have a question for you. I'm going to be able to hear it, so they're going to talk to me. Yes, hi. I'll repeat the I have a question. I heard you briefly mention uh, Miracle Grow. I have a home garden. Where do you folks stand on the use of pesticides? I get really frustrated when I, you know, get fungus and stuff like that growing on some of my fruits and, and, and vegetables that I have. So where do you stand on the use of pesticides and even fertilizers? Okay, so uh, we have a question from a home gardener that Great. is kind of asking about the use of pesticides and mm. fertilizers. Mm -hmm. um, so she says she's very frustrated with 
kind of the diseases and bugs that are kind of getting at what she's growing. Yes. And so what exactly is your stance on that or how can that totally. be? How is that addressed through the system? Yes, maybe yeah, almost as uh, alternative to miracle Grow. Yeah, okay, so I totally sympathize. Uh, and I'm sorry to hear all of that. I've <laughs> gone through plenty of that. Um, so a lot of it is going to be uh, plant selection. Uh, so choosing plants that are really um, resilient to local pests. Obviously in the tropics, there's no winter. Pests don't die. These diseases don't go dormant. Uh, so there's a lot of pressure from all angles. Uh, Another aspect is um, having a lot of biodiversity in your garden. So creating habitats for beneficial insects. So using um, perennial flowering plants. Uh, perennial basil is one of my favorites. Uh, it attracts plenty of bees and pollinators and ladybugs, things that will kind of com naturally combat okay. uh, Pest. So there are beneficial insects that are attracted exactly. to what you're trying to grow. Yeah, so uh, creating habitat, creating ecosystems. Uh, essentially, any time that a garden is heavily infested with uh, pests or disease, mm -hmm. uh, it's really important to look at that as a symptom of something mm -hmm. that's wrong, yeah. rather than actually that being the problem. Right, right. Um, so you have to look at the, the sort of ecosystem that you're creating. Uh, a lot of that, just like really basic gardening tips, like mulching is super important. It um, increases the fertility. It helps retain moisture. Mm -hmm. um, also helps with weeds. Helps with weeds. Uh, having perennial crops. Uh, I, obviously in agroforestry, mixing fruit trees. Uh, and shrubs along with your garden vegetables uh, is really important. But yeah, a, a lot of it is also having um, foods that are resilient to mm -hmm. that as well too. So things like kalo and cassava, or cassava, sweet potato, breadfruit, things like that. So is there an upcoming workshop of yours that our mm. guest can attend and transform her pesticide yes, infused I garden with the agroforestry? Yeah, I would love that. Um, so we're going to be uh, hosting uh, a workshop at I Love Nalo okay. um, probably in the next month. So okay. stay tuned. Uh, check out uncultivatedearth.org. We'll post everything there. Check out our social media. Great. Awesome. Yep. Thanks for that advice. Yeah. Let's jump back over to Haiti. <laughs> well, thanks for the, the call in. That, I think, was that the first time that's ever happened? I, th uh, I think so. I think first successful one. I think I one. tried I think to tried call and, and you guys like, like man. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so Haiti. Um, <laughs> we, uh, we're working uh, with the community to build an agroforestry hub uh, that can be used to teach workshops like we do here and then also provide um, propagation materials uh, so that then this um, hub can be used to start other hubs within Haiti. Uh, so then the idea is any reforestation uh, that is taking place can not just be a tree, but it can also be uh, vegetation that will produce food as well. I guess that could be a good, um, maybe not argument, but uh, another benefit to go into community if for some reason they're uh, deforesting their area because maybe they can make money. <coughs> and if you say, okay, well, you need to go put trees back in, but if there isn't a direct economic mm -hmm. benefit, mm -hmm. I could see that being making an easier push saying, hey, if we go in and we you know, all the benefits of reforesting an area, um, but also if there's food that could be either just providing sustenance or mm -hmm. uh, economic benefit as well, mm -hmm. that makes it a much more, I guess, stronger package of what you're offering. Yeah, I, I mean, th there's a lot of issues to address. You know, obviously uh, malnutrition uh, is one, and that's one that you face in, um, here in Hawaii and the developed world uh, all over. Um, and then creating economic opportunities for these as well. Uh, but yeah, reforesting with food and actually using uh, regenerative practices. Mm -hmm. 
uh, because so many, so much of the nutrients have been stripped away from the soil, especially when you clear cut an area and you deforest, you become so susceptible to erosion. Mm. Um, kind of like what you're seeing with like uh, oil palm right now in like mm -hmm. Indonesia, Malaysia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so actually, essentially with agroforestry and sort of permaculture practices in general, you're taking what nature is doing and putting it in fast forward. Mm. So you're kind of creating rapid succession to develop mature uh, forest. Mm. So uh, you use pioneering species, species that fix nitrogen into the soil, uh, creating a mulch layer. You know, if you walk into a forest, there's no such thing as bare soil. Right. Everything is covered in leaves. Mm -hmm. That reduces erosion, um, helps hold in the moisture. You can actually re regenerate entire landscapes um, that way by uh, essentially by holding the moisture, you can regenerate streams, bring back wildlife. Mm. Uh, and eventually, if you do it on a large enough scale, you can affect the regional climate. Um, it, it's kind of a snowball effect. If you uh, de deforest an area, it kind of dries it up. But if you start reforesting it, it, it brings it back. Awesome. Yep. So we're actually out of time. Um, Never. <laughs> yeah, out of time. Um, just to kind of wrap it up, uh, what's kind of next? You have this project on Hawaii Manalo, this project in Haiti. Is the goal to do you get more workshops going locally, or you guys want to spread your footprint out globally? What's kind of the the next thing? I'd say both. Like we're still we're, we're still really using that yeah. answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Either or. Yeah, we're, we're really young at this point. You know, we were just founded a year and a half ago. Mm. Uh, we want to continue to build networks here and do more work here, uh, but also, you know, expand and uh, help communities and learn from them as well with globally. Yes. Awesome. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Thank you guys so yeah, much thanks, for coming guys. on. Thank you.